picture on the cover of the bulletin this morning is a sculpture called Bearing Witness. And it's by the artist, uh, the sculptor Martin Perrier. Now, a native of Washington, D.C., Perrier was commissioned by the General Services Administration of the federal government to create a public statue or a sculpture to go in Federal Triangle Plaza, which is right outside the Ronald Reagan Building and the International Trade Center in Washington, D.C. And considering the prominent location of this piece, per year could have gone any number of directions. He could have chosen to honor Ronald Reagan, who the namesake of the building that this piece would go in front of, or some other notable figure in politics or in trade, considering it would be outside the International Trade Center. But instead of creating the likeness of any one particular person, Perrier went in a different direction, a more abstract direction, as you can see. Instead of crafting a particular per person or figure or a statue, Perrier instead crafted the almost enigmatic figure that you see here, this abstract and mysterious figure. And though Perrier intentionally left the form abstract to encourage people to interpret it for themselves, one art critic wrote this, which resonated with me. He described this piece as a proud head that rises on a long neck and shows a sheer face to the monuments of temporal power. See, recognizing the significance of its location, and the weight of its context, Perrier had this to say about his design. For myself, I wanted my work to be directed toward people rather than toward the government. In a democracy, the people talk back to the government. When I was asked for an explanation of the title, I said, a true democracy requires that the governed be enlightened, vigilant, and vocal. Basically, we are the government. And in this spirit, bearing witness, this sculpture that you see here, is a provocative and a beautiful reminder in the very heart of the capital that we, we the people, have not just the power but also the responsibility to critique, to correct, and to check the actions of the government. Or in per year's words, to be enlightened, vigilant, and vocal. And it's important to understand here that being critical of the government doesn't make you unpatriotic, just as being critical of religious institutions doesn't make you a heretic. In fact, it's, it's the opposite. Holding systems of power accountable and advocating for change is the essence of healthy patriotism, and it is the basis of what it means to be truly faithful. You see, institutions are fallible. Though they would like the world and you to think that they are indelible, they are indeed fallible. Even if they were begun with good intentions, institutions can become corrupt over time. They are good hiding places for the evil desires of our hearts. Evil can sneak in between the cracks and hide behind the bottom line of any institution. This is true for any institution, whether it be a government or a corporation or a nonprofit organization or even a church. None of these bodies, none of these institutions are immune from corruption or abuses of power. And none should be beyond the reproach of the people. That is what bearing witness is about. It reminds us that the work of the people is to ensure institutions are just and fair. It is our responsibility to bear witness and to call out evil when we find it. But, there's always a but. Questioning the powers that be is scary work. 
systems of power typically don't like it very much when people undermine their authority. And they don't take kindly to people questioning their actions. But it is the work of the people to do this. And for those of us who claim to be resurrection people, we are called to bear witness to the presence of God's kingdom among us. The radical reality of God's love that overcame the grave on that first Easter morning. We are currently in the season of Easter, despite what it looks like outside. And as I said last week, Easter is not just a one-time occasion or an occurrence. We are not done with Easter because Easter is not done with us. Just like winter here in Chicago, we are never done with Easter because Easter is never done with us. The staying power of resurrection is always at work in our lives, calling us away from the fears that hold us back and leading us into the fullness of life that boldly proclaims the good news of the risen Christ. So what are you afraid of? We're all afraid of something. Take a minute and fill in the blank for yourself. Now, I'm not talking about spiders, or clowns. I don't mean the things that scare you. What are your fears? What are the things that hold you back, the things that rattle you to the core, that shake you to the very foundation of your being? What is the thing or the things that you keep hidden away and you don't want anyone to know about? The fear of failure? The fear of not being enough, the fear of not being in control, the fear that others will find out that you're not who they think you are. These are paralyzing fears that keep us from living into the fullness of life that God desires for us. In Scripture, we see how fear held Peter back. The most recent occasion was when he was sitting around a fire in a courtyard outside a house where Jesus was being held under arrest. Peter was just sitting there, trying to blend in. But what happened? Three times. On three different occasions, someone recognized him as connected to Jesus, as a follower of this Jesus. And three times, what did he do? Denied him. Out of fear of what would happen to him, Peter denied knowing Jesus. Three times he turned his back on the one that he believed was the Messiah, the one that he had quit his job for and followed for three years, the one that he had professed to love. And yet in that moment, Fear made him vehemently deny even knowing Jesus. And it's this same Peter, this same Peter, and yet not quite the same Peter that we meet in our scripture reading this morning. No longer cowering outside, no longer denying his connection to Jesus, we find Peter now boldly proclaiming the risen Christ and claiming an inability to keep silent even under the threat of imprisonment and bodily harm and death. Because this is the power of resurrection. This is what becomes possible when fear doesn't hold you back anymore. When it doesn't hold you back from living into the fullness of the gospel. Peter and the other disciples were brought before the Sanhedrin because they kept talking and teaching about Jesus even though They had been told not to. The resurrection empowered them and gave them the confidence to live into the radical reality of God's love made real in the world. 
And what's important to note here is that the disciples weren't actively protesting the Sanhedrin. They weren't organizing marches against the temple authorities. They weren't trying to overthrow the Roman Empire. The disciples were simply going about the work of loving their neighbor and teaching the good news of Christ. Now, I'm not saying there's not a place for protest and for marches. But the biggest threat, the biggest threat to those who would abuse the systems of power are the people who are going about doing the work of God's kingdom among the world's kingdoms. Those who are living into the radical reality of God's love made real in the world threaten the institutions of power because it's something that they don't understand and they can't control. See, worldly systems of power, these institutions that have become so big, rely on often rely on fear to maintain control. Fear of imprisonment, fear of torture, fear of death, fear of hell, it could go on and on. This is how these worldly powers, these institutions, command, if not allegiance, then at least submission. But before the Sanhedrin, Peter gives a stirring speech. Better for us to obey God than people, which is a noble rallying cry because it speaks to the higher loyalty we have to something beyond the control of any earthly institution. But we have to be careful here because it can become a problem when we use this claim to do the things that we think are right. It becomes a problem when God's agenda suddenly looks like our agenda and God strangely seems to hate the people that we hate. We have to be careful of this rallying cry. And the question then becomes one of discernment. How do we know that we are obeying God rather than hiding behind our own desires or behind these godlike masks? How do we discern between all the false gods that clamor for our attention and the one true God that calls to us with that still, small voice? The answer only comes when we are willing to search with humility. And we're willing to hold what we find with gentleness. It comes through not letting our beliefs become so calcified that there is no longer room for God to move, no room for the Spirit to breathe new life. The lectionary reading this morning cut off right before one of my favorite Bible characters, offers an insightful judgment and a prophetic pronouncement. I encourage you to go read, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story, but I'll give you a brief overview. You see, this bold speech of Peter's, this stirring speech that he gives to the Sanhedrin, it enrages them, and they want, the leaders want to execute Peter and the rest of the disciples. When a man by the name of Gamaliel, 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 it's pronounced many different ways, choose your own, who was a well-known Pharisee and a well-respected teacher of the law, steps in and he offers a word of wisdom. He begins by naming a few other would-be messiahs that he had seen rise and fall over the years. And then he makes the case for why the court shouldn't kill these disciples. He says, the present case is similar to those. My advice is that you leave these people alone and let them be. If this movement, this activity is of human origin, it will destroy itself. If, but if, on the other hand, it comes from God, not only will you be unable to destroy them, but you might find yourselves fighting against God. Needless to say, the court took his advice, and instead of killing Peter and the others, they simply had them flogged and released. But his words call us forward with wisdom. 
to discern our way forward, we need both the boldness of Peter and the wisdom of Gamaliel. We need the courage to speak up when necessary and the humility to allow God to move in ways that we may not understand. In this Easter season, for the next few weeks until Pentecost, we will be following the lectionary readings through this book of Acts. We'll accompany the disciples and we will bear witness to what's possible when we're willing to live into the power and the reality of the resurrection. So come, Easter people, I invite you to come and to lift up your voice to speak a word of life. To not be afraid as you let wisdom guide you and the spirit inspire you to practice resurrection as you make your way through this world. Amen.